Hello, Mississippi. Hello. Beautiful. Well, I have to start by saying that 2020 is looking really easy, isn't it? I think the fake news media back there is starting to get it, folks. I think they're starting. They're starting to understand what's going on, and I'm thrilled to be back in this great state with thousands of proud, loyal, hardworking American patriots. Thank you. In less than two years, we've achieved the biggest comeback in American history. That's what's happened. The economy is booming, wages are rising, and more Americans are working today than ever before, today, ever before. Think of that. Now, just think of that. Today, we have more Americans working than we've ever had in the history of our country right now, today. How great is that, right? We're defending our Second Amendment, protecting religious liberty, taking care of our great veterans, and rebuilding America's military like it hasn't been rebuilt ever before. This week, we made history again when I announced that we are replacing the job killing disaster known as NAFTA with a brand new U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. A good one. And it's a good one. We're calling it USMCA. You're going to like that name. That'll become a part of your vocabulary. USMCA. Companies aren't going to be leaving us anymore and firing everybody and sending their product back into the United States with no tax. That was what I wanted. You know, Mississippi, when they'd leave and they'd go next door and they'd fire everybody and they'd build the product and send it back and sell it to the same people that were buying it before. No, we don't want to do that anymore. So, we don't want to do that anymore. That's not a good that's not a good thing to do, although there is a group called Globalists. They think it's just fine, not fine. The Globalists. The Globalists. We don't like the thinking of the Globalists. The USMCA is an incredible victory for our farmers, our ranchers, our factory workers, and our entire nation. America is winning again, and America is being respected again, may be respected like never before, because we are finally putting America first. But exactly five weeks from today, all of this extraordinary progress is at stake. It is at stake. I'm not on the ballot, but in a certain way, I'm on the ballot, so please go out and vote. Go out and vote. On November 6th, you will head to the polls, hopefully, in one of the most important congressional elections of our lifetime. The only reason to vote Democrat is if you are tired of winning. A Democrat takeover of Congress will plunge our country into gridlock and chaos like you haven't seen before. It'll come to a halt, and I have to tell you, all of those people with 
your savings accounts and your money piled up in your bank, it's all, a lot of it's going to disappear, and it'll disappear really fast. Your 401ks. I stand up all the time with great Americans. Sir, I'd like to thank you. My wife thinks I'm one of the greatest investors in the world. And two years ago, she thought I was a total loser, sir. Now she loves me so much. Because my 401k has gone up 55 percent, sir, since you got elected. 55 percent. It's amazing you can really get your wife to like you a lot when that happens. You got to be really bad. I'll tell you. And that's happening. And it goes the other way, too. That happens. People are geniuses now, and we've helped. You know, we had probably, and even the fake news would tell you, the greatest victory in the history of this country in 2016. There's never been anything like that. The people came from the hills and the valleys. They came from all over. And they voted, voted, voted. And they loved Trump, and they loved us. Because it wasn't me, it was all of us. It was all of us, and that's what's happening. That's what's happening. But it's all fragile. The Democrats will open our borders to deadly drugs and ruthless gangs. The Democrats, and I say this, and I've dealt with it, the Democrats are the party of crime, and that's what it is. They're the party of crime. Radical Democrats want to tear down our laws, tear down our institutions in pursuit of power, demolish our prosperity, in the name of socialism, and probably worse, and abolish our borders in the service of globalism. There is nothing Democrats aren't willing to do, and you're seeing it day by day, and you've seen it more in the last week than you've ever seen it before. And no one, just think of this, no one under any circumstances, is allowed to speak up if you're on this side of the equation. But guess what? We're speaking up like nobody has ever spoken up before. They want to get the power that they so desperately crave that was taken away from them. All of the Democrats know and all they really know how to do is obstruct, resist, demolish, destroy, and delay. They've been trying to destroy Judge Kavanaugh since the very first second he was announced. Because they know Judge Kavanaugh will follow the Constitution as written. You know, for 10 years, I don't know him, I never met him, but I've been hearing there's this guy named Brett Kavanaugh, who is, who is like a perfect person who's destined for the Supreme Court. I've heard that for a long time. And a lot of smart people. And first in his class at Yale, top, top in his class at Yale Law School, He's led, like, a life that's unbelievable. He's had no problems. They've never taken him out of restaurants. They've never done — this is like a person that everybody thought 
at the highest level on both sides. They said, someday he will be a Supreme Court judge. Right? He will be a justice of the Supreme Court. And all my life, I've heard that the most important thing that a president has to do as president is the appointment of a Supreme Court justice. And and I disagree. I think war, I think our military, I think peace, I think those things are, you know, those things are pretty important, right? It's pretty important. They don't say that, but I say those things are pretty important. But I have to tell you, the appointment of a Supreme Court justice, and I looked at him, and I looked at the man that we appointed just before him, Justice Neil Gorsuch. <laughs> who was put through the paces, but nothing like what's happening now is just crazed. It's crazy. What's happening now, they had gang rape, a gang rape, many times. Well, that turned out to be false. So many different charges, guilty, until proven innocent, that's very dangerous for our country. That's very dangerous for our country. And I have it myself all the time. But for me, it's like a part of the job description. <laughs> Let it happen to me. Shouldn't happen to him. Shouldn't happen to him. What he's going through, 36 years ago, this happened. I had one beer, right? I had one beer. Well, do you think it was? Nope, it was one beer. Oh, good. How did you get home? I don't remember. How'd you get there? I don't remember. Where is the place? I don't remember. How many years ago was it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What neighborhood was it in? I don't know. Where's the house? I don't know. Upstairs, downstairs, where was it? I don't know. But I had one beer. That's the only thing I remember. And a man's life is in tatters. A man's life is shattered. His wife is shattered. His daughters, who are beautiful, incredible young kids, they destroy people. They want to destroy people. These are really evil people. And then you see, and then you see the people that are doing it. I know everyone, I could tell you things about every one of them. Nang, Richard Blumenthal. This guy lied about his service. He didn't just say, gee, I was in the service. No, he said, I was in the Marines. Da Nang province. Soldiers dying left and right as we battled up the hill. This went on for 15 years when he was the Attorney General of Connecticut. I thought he was a great war hero. And then it turned out he was never in Vietnam. He was in the reserves. And I watched him two days ago. I watched him saying, we need the truth. If we don't have, and here's a guy who was saying people were dying all around him and he was never there. And then he cried when they caught him. He cried like a baby, like a baby. When Jimmy Swaggart cried, it was nothing compared to Da Nang Richard. Nothing. Jimmy Swaggart was nothing compared to He cried, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so he only lied for 15 years, and now he gets up. And now he talks about lying. And this man's not lying. So Blumenthal is a fraud. He's a fraud. And the reason he got elected is because in Connecticut, it's impossible for a Republican to get elected. And I did well there, but you can't. He actually gave up the race. He thought he lost. You remember that? He sort of gave you, stop campaigning. It was over. And then he won by three points. And we have him in the Senate. And now he's this great honorable guy. Because you know why? The fake news doesn't ever want to put that stuff on. 
They don't want to talk about it. They don't ever want to put it on. They're a bunch of fakers. And then you have Cory Booker, right? Cory Booker. Here's a guy who destroyed, practically by himself, the city of Newark, New Jersey. He was such a bad mayor. And see what he wrote himself about women. Check it out, folks. Check it out. Then he talks, how dare you treat a woman like that? Take a look at what this guy wrote. And I know about every one of them. I could go on and on. How about Feinstein? How about him? We need more time for the FBI. The FBI has to do a more thorough search. We had another woman just reported by a sleazebag lawyer named Abiate. Sleazebag. Sleazebag. We have, well, it turned out even NBC, who's as bad as they get, even NBC couldn't shield her with that interview. Did you see that interview? This woman had no clue what was going on. No clue. And yet she made the most horrible charges against a number one in his class at Yale. Perfect human being, great father, great husband. This is a, a great person. And people are saying, well, maybe it's true. And because of the fact that maybe it's true, he should not become a United States Supreme Court justice. How horrible is this? How horrible is this? So this is an important time for our country. This is a time when your father, when your husband, when your brother, when your son could do great. Mom, I did great in school. I've worked so hard. Mom, I'm so pleased to tell you I just got a fantastic job with IBM. I just got a fantastic job with General Motors. I just got, I'm so proud. Mom, a terrible thing just happened. A person who I've never met said that I did things that were horrible, and they're firing me from my job, Mom. I don't know what to do. Mom, what do I do? What do I do, Mom? What do I do, Mom? It's a damn sad situation, okay? And we better start as a country getting smart and getting tough and not letting that stuff right back there, all those cameras, tell us how to live our lives. Because they are really dishonest people. Not all of them, but damn well most of them. That I can tell you. Fake news. So that's something to think about, right? That's something to think of your son. Think of your husband. Think I've had many false accusations. I've had it all. The, I've had so many. And when I say it didn't happen, nobody believes me. But it's me. It's my job description. Mr. Trump, it's okay. You can say whatever you want. They can say whatever they want about me. It's fine. Because we have the worst libel laws anywhere in the world. They can say anything they want. And we can't sue them. Because if you're famous, you can't sue. Figure that one out. But to take people that are just outstanding, have had great lives, and that life doesn't mean a thing. And you notice with the judge, they don't talk about his last 35 years. They don't talk about what everybody knows him. He's a very well-known, the most highly respected person until the last couple of weeks because they're destroying him and they're destroying his reputation and we can't let that happen. We can't. We can't let it happen. And I don't even know him, folks. I don't even know him. I met him for the first time a few weeks ago. I don't even know him. So it's not like, oh, gee, I want to protect my friend. I want to do what's right for this country. This is a very important time in our country. Okay? Very important thing. Very important time in our country. The Democrat Party has become too extreme. This is an example of it. And too dangerous to be trusted with power. That is why you must vote Republican 
on election day, and you have to go out and vote. You know, I'm listening to commentators, and they say if Trump were running, he's going to beat everybody. They're saying that. You know, it's hard for them to admit that. And I certainly dream about all these people. Biden, the guy never had more than 1% in a poll when he was running for president. And then Obama took him off the trash heap, right? Biden, I hear Biden, wants to take me to the back of a barn. He would be in big trouble, I will tell you. Remember he said that? I'd like to take him. You know, with Biden, you go like this. And he goes down. Biden. And the other ones. But they say that Donald Trump isn't running. So will the people go out and vote? In three words. You got to go out and vote. And they say, but Donald Trump doesn't like Congress. I really do. I like a lot of the people in Congress. Some I'm disappointed in. But for the most part, and I have to tell you something, we have the right ideas. We're making our country great again. We're doing the right thing. We need more Republican votes. They say we have a majority. We barely have. If somebody has a cold and stays home, we don't have a majority. That's how bad it is. Republicans have to go out and vote. And they say if I was on the ticket, everybody would go, it would be a landslide. Even the fakers back there, they say that. And I'm not on the ticket, but I am on the ticket. Because this is also a referendum about me and the disgusting gridlock that they'll put this country through. Think of it. We have the greatest economy in history. We have a military that will soon be the strongest we've ever had. Our country is doing so well. And then we have a Maxine Waters saying we have to get rid of him. We have to get rid of him. Maxine Waters. And Nancy Pelosi, she's another beauty. Get out and vote. I want you to vote. Pretend I'm on the ballot. And don't worry, we'll be on the ballot in two years and we will do a landslide like you haven't, like you wouldn't believe. A couple of the reporters I see back there, they said, oh, Trump is running. And I must say, one of them said, right after I announced, June 16th, right after I announced, there was a Sunday morning show, and one of them said, you know he's going to win, don't you? And another one who's back there now, who's looking very well, said, along with the host, oh, ho, 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 you're only kidding. He's just doing this for fun. You think this is fun? Yeah, actually, it's sort of fun. I guess it is. For me, it's fun. For me, it's fun. You know why it's fun? Because we're achieving our goals better than anyone thought possible. That's why it's fun. If I wasn't, it wouldn't be fun. But this one particular reporter, she said, ho, 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 you're only kidding, right? Ha, <laughs> ha, that's so funny. And I'll never forget, on election night, Donald Trump is your next president, folks. And it's driving them crazy. So we're thrilled to be here tonight, and I am having a lot of fun. But it is true, I'm having fun, because nobody ever would have believed in a million years that we would have accomplished what we've accomplished. Nobody has accomplished more in two years. You take a look at the first two years of any pre nobody has even come close to accomplishing what we've accomplished. And I'm doing it for you, and we're doing it together, because this is a whole thing that has never happened in our country before. You know, it's interesting. When we first started, there were a lot of people always showing up. And by the way, you think this is a big crowd in here. This place is packed, right? Right to them. And if there was one empty seat, they would say, as the Washington Post did say, the Washington Post came, you saw that, right? Came to an arena someplace four hours early, and they hadn't started letting the people in yet. And he put a picture of an empty arena. There were tens of thousands of people outside 
waiting to come in. The Washington Post put a picture of an empty arena and they put a caption to the effect, Mr. President, not a very good crowd, is it? And you know what happened? And they had a picture up of an empty arena like I was a I didn't even land for four and a half hours later. And when I landed, that place was just like this. It was packed with thousands of people outside. Now, did they fire that reporter? No. Did they fire that reporter? No. Right? They, they, isn't it incredible? Isn't it sad? And look what happened to Roseanne. Did they fire Roseanne? Yes. No, but think of it. Puts a picture of an empty, like it had 5%. People were just starting to trickle in. And said, not a very good crowd, Mr. President. There was no games. You know what happened that night? People that were sitting on stairwells, people that couldn't get a seat, people that were here only because the fire marshals were so incredible, that shouldn't have even been allowed to come in, with thousands outside. They said, this is a fraud by the Washington Post. I was there. There were no empty seats. We set a record that evening for crowd attendance because we don't need much of a stage. Basketball, they need a big, you're filled up with people like it is tonight. And we barely got an apology. And he admitted he was wrong. You know where he did it? On his little Twitter account. <laughs> and that kind of dishonesty happens all the time. Happened at the inauguration. It happened at the inauguration. It happens all the time. These are very, very dishonest people. We are thrilled to be joined tonight by several great Republican leaders. And we're going to start with a friend of mine who's a very special man, very special. He's a great governor, done a fantastic job. He called me. He built the African American Museum, called me. We went there. It was so beautiful. We had — I was at the opening. We cut the ribbon. Governor Phil Bryant. Governor. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Should we bring Phil up here? He's been so — come on. Get up here, Phil. Come, come, come. Come on, Phil. Get up here. What a great governor he's been. Look at this guy. Is he central casting or what? Is he? Look at this. He's central casting, but you know where he's really good? His heart and his brain. Great brain and great heart. Say a few words. Thank you. Are we proud to have Donald J. Trump here in Mississippi? Wow. All right, I won't get started, but I can tell you what. This man has done more as President of the United States in two years than any president that I can ever remember or ever studied about. He is a remarkable man that is making America great again. Thank you very much, Phil. Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves. Tate? Tate? Where is Tate? Thanks, Tate. Doing a good job. And Mississippi Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman. Delbert? Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank your members of Congress that are here because they've been warriors, they've been friends. They helped me with the biggest tax cuts in the history of our country, the biggest tax reform, the great regulation cuts, which could be even more important, frankly, than the tax cuts, if you want to know the truth, because it means jobs. But you have some great congressmen, Trent Kelly. Trent, thank you. Greg Harper. Thank you very much. And David Kustoff. Thank you, David. 
There's another warrior in the room. These are warriors. Look, the, the abuse they take, the abuse we all take. If you're not a warrior, you just go home. Go to the corner, put your thumb in your mouth, and say, Mommy, take me home. You got to be a warrior. And a guy who is a wonderful friend of mine and has always been there for me, Senator Roger Wicker. Roger. What a great — and Mrs. Wicker, thank you. What a great guy. And he's doing great. Get out and vote for him anyway. He's winning by a lot, but get out there and vote. We love Roger. Finally, I want to introduce the person we are all here tonight to support, a true Mississippi patriot, Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith. Come on up. Cindy, come up. Thank you, Mr. President, and I told him he would get a warm Mississippi welcome, and you did not disappoint. Yes! We are the hospitality state, Mr. President, and I tell you, it is such an honor to work with this man. Is he not the best president we have ever had? This is wonderful. You know, early on, I was a supporter of then-candidate Donald J. Trump, and I was on his Ag Advisory Committee. And now, every time I walk onto the Senate floor, I want to help President Donald J. Trump. It is such an honor to work with a man that I tell you, he loves the veterans, he loves the military, and he loves our law enforcement as well. You know, this past week, this past week in Brookhaven, Mississippi, my hometown, we had two officers shot down this past weekend, and I was able to tell him about that. James White and Zach Moak, and then the next day, we had a Mississippi Highway Patrol trooper, Josh Smith, shot down. And I'm just gonna ask you, to remember those people in your prayers as we continue on with this. We've had a tragic week in Mississippi with our law enforcement, but this man supports law enforcement 100%. I just want to thank our great governor, Phil Bryant, for making me your U.S. Senator to appoint me to that, an opportunity of three lifetimes. Other than being the mother of Anna Michael Smith and the husband of Mike Smith, it is the greatest honor of my life. And what a treat to serve with Senator Roger Wicker. When I tell you he's been a friend, he has been a friend to me on the Senate floor, no doubt. I tell you, you know, when I was sworn in as your U.S. Senator, Vice President Mike Pence, he put this pen right here on me, and he said, Cindy, this pen will get you in any door in Washington, D.C., but I want you to know this isn't my pen. This is your pen. This is Mississippi's pen. We've got a lot of work to do in Washington, D.C. This man is leading the charge. We're going to get back on Air Force One, and we're going back to Washington, because you know what? We've got a Supreme Court justice to get confirmed. We've got him. So I'm going to ask for your prayers also for the Kavanaugh family. And I'll tell you tonight, my true prayer is God will continue to bless these great state of the United States. Thank you, Cindy.
Thank you, Cindy. Great. You know, we had a great friend who was senator and did a fantastic job. And it was just his time. He called me. It was his time. And you know who I'm talking about. Wonderful man. And he said, you're going to have to appoint somebody. And I went to Phil. I said, Phil, who's the best? And Phil had no doubt in his mind. That's who he recommended. And since then, Cindy has voted with me 100 percent of the time. She's always had my back. She's always had your back. And a vote for Cindy is a vote for me and make America great again. Right? And a vote for Cindy's opponent, Mike Espy, is a vote for Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and the legendary low IQ person, Maxine Waters. That's why Schumer's PAC is funding Mike Espy with a lot of money. A vote for Espy is a vote for the Democrat agenda to open borders and for radical socialism. When Espy was in Congress, he even sponsored legislation alongside Nancy Pelosi to provide taxpayer-funded health care to illegal aliens. Oh, that's great. That's just what Mississippi wants. I don't think that works in Mississippi. Does that work? I don't think so. I don't think so. Your vote in this election will decide which party controls the United States Senate. It's very important. Very important. And that's a great woman. That's a great woman. Gotten to know her very well over the last number of months. If Democrats get control, they will raise your taxes, flood your streets with criminal aliens, weaken our military, outlaw private health insurance, and replace freedom with socialism. In a short period of time, of course, I'll be doing lots of vetoes, just so don't worry too much. They will turn America into Venezuela. How's that working out? And our country will never be Venezuela. We won't let that happen. If Democrats get 51 seats, the key Senate committees will be run by the far left. Bernie Sanders, crazy Bernie. It's amazing that he wasn't more angry that the election got stolen from him, right? I don't get it. You know, he's always, like, complaining, complaining. He's jumping around. The hair's going crazy. The hair's going crazy. He's jumping and like a lunatic. But he never complained about the fact that Crooked Hillary cheated him out of the election. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, Bernie was on television recently, and he was screaming and ranting and raving. And I said to my wife, Melania, who's now in Africa representing us, First Lady. I watched her get off that plane this morning in Africa, and so beautiful. And she was hugging and kissing children. It was beautiful to see. She's doing a great job as First Lady, I will tell you. Really? And you think that's an easy job? That's a not an easy job. That's a tough job. She's fantastic. But Bernie Sanders was ranting and raving and we're going to this and Trump and Trump and we got to stop. What's he going to stop? Having a strong military? Having low taxes? Having borders? What's he going to stop? What am I doing? What's he going to stop? Having less regulation? But he's going to stop Trump. He's going to stop Trump. He's going to stop us left and right. He's ranting and raving. And the commentator looks at him and goes, you know he's winning, don't you? 
And Bernie just looked at him like this. It was like, but I said to my brother, you got to hand it to him. You know, he's out there. He's doing his thing, whether you like it or not. He's out there doing his thing, and you got to hand it to him. But a, a guy like Bernie would be in charge of the budget committee. Patrick Leahy, oh, he's never had a drink in his life. <laughs> Check it out. Look under Patrick Leahy slash drink. How dare you have a beer while you're in high school? How dare? Patrick Leahy dash drink will be in charge of the Appropriations Committee. Bob Menendez, you don't know about him. We'll be in charge. I'll leave him alone, because we can't cover too many of these characters, right? But I'm going to leave him alone. We'll be in charge of Foreign Affairs and the great Diane Feinstein. We'll be in charge of the Judiciary Committee? You know. Wasn't that great? Wasn't that great? Wasn't that something the other day? She was asked a simple question. Did you leak the document? Wasn't that great? By John Cornyn. He goes, you leaked the document. No. What? No. Uh, remember? No. Oh, no, I didn't. No, uh, I don't think I, well, wait. Did we leak the document? No! How about the aid? No, you idiot, no! No, we didn't leak the document. We didn't leak the document. No, we didn't. That was the worst body language that I've ever seen. Ah, oh, what a group. What a group. Holier than thou, aren't they? Holier than thou. You know the expression, right? What a group! Also at stake in this election is Medicare. Democrats in Washington want to raid Medicare to pay for their socialist agenda. They're going to destroy it. <laughs> Republicans want to protect Medicare for our great seniors who earned it and paid for it. Right? Right? And we will always protect Americans with pre-existing location. Well, you have to do that. Pre-existing conditions, we have to take care of pre-existing conditions because it's just the way life is, folks. We have to do that. And the Democrats are talking about it, and they can't do it because they have no plan. So just put it down. And some Republicans say, is that a Republican thing? Whether it is or not, and to me it is, and it always will be. Pre-existing conditions will always be taken care of by us. Have to do it. We have to do it. We have to do it. And we want to do it. I want to do it. We're all going to do it. We're doing well. We'll take it from China. We'll take it from the European Union, who has taken advantage of us for years. We'll take it from Japan. We'll take it from our new, beautiful transaction, which is a fair transaction, and good for them, too. Mexico, Canada. We're going to have plenty of money coming in, folks, when we fix up these horrible trade deals. So we're going to take care of pre-existing conditions. People that have a problem are going to be helped by the Republican Party from, from the time I got elected, really. You look at what we've done with Obamacare. It's a disaster. We had it beaten, but I'll say it a different way than I have been saying it. We didn't get one Democrat vote. We had it repealed and replaced. A little shocker took place early in the morning. But the fact is, we didn't get one Democrat vote. We would have saved a trillion dollars. Think of it. Our country would have saved one trillion dollars had we gotten that extra vote. We didn't get one vote from one Democrat. But we've pretty much dismantled it. And here's the nice story. We've managed it well. And your premiums have gone up very little by comparison. Remember, they're going up 156, 201, 187, 116 percent. Now we have it down. But we're getting rid of it entirely. We're going to have great health care. The new platform of the Democrat Party is to abolish ICE, the brave, brave people of ICE. 
In other words, they want to abolish immigration enforcement entirely. That's what they want to do. Democrats also support strongly sanctuary cities of death. Sanctuary cities. Every day, sanctuary cities are unleashing vicious predators and bloodthirsty killers like MS-13 into our communities. They go out and they hide out in sanctuary cities. Then they come into our cities and our towns. And then we send ICE in, and ICE has no problem. You know why? Because ICE is much tougher and much smarter than them. And ICE has done an incredible job. And they grab them by the neck and they throw them the hell out of our country or they throw them into jail. And you don't want that job. And you don't want that job. And you don't even want, although maybe you could handle that job. Right? But they do a fantastic job. And we have to cherish our law enforcement. And that goes for Border Patrol. That goes for ICE. We're setting records on the border on arrests. We don't want to do that. We're building the wall. It's going up. But getting money is brutal. Brutal. So we've started the wall, and we've done a lot in California and elsewhere, San Diego. We're moving eastward, and we're covering a lot of territory. They gave us a billion six, a billion six, and another billion six. I want the whole thing, because we can do the whole damn wall, and we can do a great one in one year. But getting money from the Democrats is tough because they know that's a big issue for us. And they know we need it. Most of them voted for it in 2006. I don't know if you know that. Most of them, but of course you have to have a wall. You have people pouring across. They're tackling people. Then, of course, they have catch and release. You catch somebody. Who is this person? It's a criminal. Oh, that's okay. Catch, take his name, and release the person. And the person they think will come back to court. We have the dumbest immigration laws in the whole world. Watch what happens over the next couple of weeks, folks. Watch. Watch. And it's all because of the Democrats. Every Republican wants some change, but they stop you. The only thing they're good at, they're lousy politicians. They're horrible in policy. They don't know what the hell they're doing. They're only good at one thing, resisting. They're good at sticking together. You rarely see them break up. They stick. Like glue, they stick. That's the only thing they're good at. Delay and resist. Republicans believe America should be a sanctuary for law-abiding Americans, not for criminal aliens. If you want security, if you want a strong border, if you want to have a country that is a great, great, safe country, then you need to go out and you need to vote Republican have to do it. And everybody, this election in November is about safety, and it's also about prosperity. They're going to take your wealth away from you. They're going to take your wealth away. All of that we've done with the jobs and the salaries and the wages that are rising for the first time in 21 years, they're going to take it away from you so fast. Since the election, we have created over 4 million new jobs, unheard of, unheard of, unheard of. And lifted almost 4 million Americans off of food stamps. That's a big thing. We've added nearly 600,000 new manufacturing jobs. You remember when the previous administration said, oh, you can't do manufacturing? I said, really? Who's going to build things? They said you won't add any. They said you needed a magic wand. Remember, a magic wand. We don't have a magic wand. We've got good policy. We've got good leadership. We have a lot of good leaders in our party. And you've heard this many times over the last three weeks. African-American unemployment has reached its lowest rate ever recorded, ever. 
ever. Remember, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose, right? What do you have to lose, I said. And people said, oh, that's not nice. But I said, wait, they have the worst crime rate. They have the worst schools. They have the worst home ownership percentages. They have the worst. I went through a list of 10 different things. And I looked up. And they've always voted for Democrats, the African-Americans, in 95 more percent. And I looked up and I said, what the hell do you have to lose, remember? And now, not only do they have the lowest unemployment rate in history, but African-American poverty has reached its lowest rate also ever recorded. It's a great thing, right? So, and we've just started. We've just started. Remember, same true for Hispanic Americans. The lowest unemployment rate ever recorded. Same for Asian Americans. Lowest unemployment rate ever recorded. Women, lowest unemployment rate in 65 years. After years and years of working so hard, we finally put ourselves in a position where we can do things, and we can really do them. But we could do them an awfully lot better if we had more, a real majority, not a majority of one, not a majority of, literally, if somebody's sick, it's like we have to postpone votes. We need a real majority and we're going to do everything that you've been looking for for a long time. You know, with that being said, we've done so much. We've done so much. We've just finalized the tremendous new trade agreement with South Korea, where it was a disaster. That was a Hillary Clinton catastrophe. Remember, she said, we are going to create 250,000 new jobs. And she was right for South Korea. It was good. And we've just totally renegotiated it. We've made it good. And we've opened up new negotiations with Japan, who would not negotiate with the previous administration. You know why? Because they said, no, we're happy. Why should we negotiate? We're not going to negotiate. Well, we said we want to negotiate. And with the European Union, we want to negotiate. And they said, I love you, too. You're not my type, but I love you. That was a strong guy, by the way, in case. Because if that was a woman, I'm in big trouble. And you know what? I, I, go, I hope you're a guy, are you? So, so, the European Union and Japan, I said, listen, we lost 151 billion, with a B, with you. We lost 151 billion. Jean-Claude. He's the head of the European Union. I said, Jean-Claude, he's tough and smart, smart, really tough. I don't think he likes our country too much, but I've told him that many times. <laughs> well, they were formed, right? They were formed in order to take advantage of us. So Jean-Claude, for years, the Obama administration wanted to negotiate, and you said, no, we're not going to negotiate. I'm telling you, I want to negotiate. We lost $151 billion with the European Union. Many of us come from the European Union. I do. I do. Many of the people in the room sound so nice, European Union. And they're, they're just killing us. So I said, we have to negotiate. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Two weeks go by, we don't get a call. I call him up again and say, Jean-Claude, we got to negotiate. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Beautiful accent. I wish I had his accent. I would have been president 15 years ago if I had his answer. And I said, Jean-Claude, please, we got to negotiate. I can't take this 151 billion we lose. You have barriers against our farmers. We can't sell farm products. You have barriers against our cars, and yet you give us millions of Mercedes and BMW and all these cars they pour into our country. You have barriers, and you charge us big tariffs for products. And you make it impossible for us to give you prop, but you sell us so much. Jean-Claude, we have to negotiate. And he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Two weeks go by. 
No negotiation. I say, Jean-Claude, you don't have to negotiate anymore, Jean-Claude. I am going to put a 25% tariff on Mercedes-Benz, BMW, and every car you send in to the United States. We're putting a 25% tariff or tax on every car, millions and millions of cars, that you send into the United States. He said, no, 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 don't, please, I will be there tomorrow morning. This was an evening. I get to my office, he's there. I said, where did you come from, New York? No, 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 I came from Europe. I said, let me know the name of that plane. That is the fastest plane. And now they're dying to make a deal. You saw what's been going on with these deals. China! They're draining us. They're taking our money. They're rebuilding themselves. They're building a jet a day. They're building many, many bridges the size and bigger than, like, the George Washington Bridge. What are we doing? We're helping them. We've rebuilt China. They've taken so much money. I like President Xi, the head of China. But I said, we can't do this anymore. So now we put $50 billion of tariffs on. And they said, they said, no, 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 you cannot do that. If you go 50, we'll go 50. I said, wait a minute. We're already 500 billion behind. So if I go 50, you go 50, that means we're at the same place we started from. That's not what this is all about. We have to bring some balance. We can't do this. So they said no. So it was 50 at 10 percent. I increased it to 25 percent, and I put 200 billion on top of the 50. So now we have 250 billion dollars at 25 percent. By the way, billions and billions of dollars, the fake news people back there, all those people with all those red lights, they don't want to talk about it. But all of that money, billions of dollars, will be flowing into our Treasury. Many of the products that we're buying over there will be made in the United States because they don't want to pay the tax, and there's no tax. And I said, if you attack our farmers, who I love, they're special. See, he's got the green hat on. Make our farmers great again. Right? Make our farmers great again. But they said, you know what? The farmers love Trump. We'll attack the farmers by not buying. Well, guess what? They're starting to buy again, aren't they? But I said, if you do that, we're going to put an additional $267 billion on to your numbers. So we're going to have 500 and probably it'll end up $562 billion when you add it all up, including the little stars all over the place. And you know what? They want to talk. They want to make a deal. And China's been hurt very badly over the last number of months. Their markets are down 30 percent, and our markets are up 55 percent since I became president. And I hope we can make a deal with China, but honestly, who knows? But we're very happy where we are. Very, very happy. And I want to thank the farmers, because, you know, I watch the farmers. And they say, and don't forget, the farmers have been going down like this for 20 years, long before I got here. We're going to bring those green caps. You're going to be so proud of me, okay? You're going to be so proud. They want to talk, and at some point, they're talking. But I told them, just recently, you're not ready to talk yet. You're not ready. In all fairness, they've been making so much money, it's hard for them to say they're making $500 billion a year because we had uh, — let's be nice — we had presidents that it wasn't their thing. But it is my thing. Do you know how wealthy our country would be if they didn't have these really stupid deals all over the place? So many of them. And how about our military deals, where we protect rich nations and we don't get reimbursed? How about that stuff? That's changing, too, folks. We protect Saudi Arabia. Would you say they're rich? And I love the king, King Solomon, but I said, King, we're protecting you. You might not be there for two weeks without us, 
You have to pay for your military. You have to pay. And Japan is going to also contribute. You know, Japan, we protect Japan. They pay us a small percentage. We protect South Korea. They pay us. And by the way, we're doing great on North Korea, but South Korea, they got to reimburse us. They got to reimburse us. <laughs> Republicans passed, and I signed the biggest package of tax cuts and reform in the history of our country. We have cut a record number of regulations. Now, we got no Democrat support for any of this. This is what's driving our economy, those two things. We have approved a record number of affordable, generic drugs. Watch what's going to happen to drug prices. And to help critically ill patients get access to life-saving treatments, we pass what's called right to try. A person's terminally ill. They're going to die. And before me, if we had a drug that was really looking good or promising, we wouldn't give them because we didn't want to hurt the person. They're going to die. And it is actually much more complicated than that. They've been trying to pass this for 45 years. Well, two months ago, I signed right to try. We have the greatest drugs in the world the greatest drug makers in the world. I would watch wealthy people travel all over the world trying to find a cure. And poor people just went home. They had no hope. Now they have the right to try. If we have a drug that looks good, but it's two years or three years or four years out, and by the way, we brought that number from 15 years, we think it's going to be down to four, and in some cases, three. Way down. Scott is doing a great job. Scott, get that number down, Scott. And now we have that, I love that, Right to Try, such a great name. Right to Try, you have hope. We also passed Veterans Choice, 44 years they tried to do it. Giving our veterans the right to see a private doctor if they've got to wait online for weeks and weeks and weeks. 44 years! And we passed the landmark VA Accountability Act. That's people that work in the VA that treat our veterans badly, and we couldn't do a thing about it. And now we can fire them so fast. We'll see you. I just signed legislation. And you think that was easy, getting that through the unions and civil service? That was a 48-year job. And your two senators helped me a lot, I will tell you. They helped me a lot. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Roger. And your congressman, by the way, helped me a lot, in particular your congressman. I just signed legislation to completely rebuild our military, securing $700 billion, and then the following year, $716 billion to purchase the finest planes and ships and tanks and missiles and submarines on the face of the earth. All made in America, made in the USA. And we have given our troops their largest pay raise in more than a decade. Isn't that nice? About time. At my direction, the Pentagon is now working very hard to create the sixth branch of the American Armed Forces. It's called the Space Force. So you have the Air Force, you have the Space Force. Separate. The Space Force. And that's what it's all about, folks. You look at what's happening. I'm not just talking rockets to the moon and to Mars. I'm talking about defense. I'm talking about, that's where it is. It's in space. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, right? Space Force. I withdrew the United States from the horrible, one-sided Iran nuclear deal. And Iran is a much different country. They're trying to put out all the riots they have all over that country. You know, when I became president, I looked there, before I became, I said, how are you stopping Iran? Nobody was able to tell me. 
And I did this, and they have shattered, man. They have shattered. I got rid of that deal. How about we gave them 150 billion for nothing? We gave them 1.8 billion in cash for nothing. And we've recognized the capital of Israel and opened the American embassy in Jerusalem. And we won't even mention how well we're doing with North Korea. But when I came in there, too, they were going to go to war with North Korea. President Obama said it was his biggest problem. We sat before I took office. What's your biggest problem? The biggest problem is North Korea. We're going to go to war with North Korea. We're doing very well now with North Korea. You don't feel that way anymore, right? You don't feel that way anymore. And the fake news comes out and says, he's giving so much. I haven't given anything. We got our hostages back, right? We've got a lot, and we're getting the remains of our great fallen heroes back. There's been no rockets launched. There's been no missiles launched. There's been no nuclear tests. And we have a good relationship. And Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo is going over to North Korea next week, and we're working on a second summit, and it just feels good. Now, who knows, folks? Who knows? I can just tell you, when we came in, before I came in, and at the beginning, when the rhetoric was tough, right? That rhetoric was tough. These people were saying, oh, he's going to get us into a war. Well, guess what? That worked out. That rhetoric was tough. And let's see what happens, but we're doing very well. We're doing very well. For years, you watched as your leaders apologized for America. Now you have a president who is standing up for America. We are standing up for your values. We are standing up for Mississippi. We are standing proudly we are standing up for your national anthem. A lot of spirit. A lot of spirit. One of them said the other day, you know, President Trump can't be beaten in 2020. That's driving them crazy. Oh. <laughs> Who the hell's going to beat us? Look, who's going to beat us? If, if another president came here and they said, we're coming to Mississippi and we're going to make a speech, you know how many people would show up? Really? 300, 400. You'd have a medium-sized meeting room at a hotel, right? Look at this place. Look at this place. Look at this place. We're lifting millions of our citizens from welfare to work, from dependence to independence, and from poverty to prosperity. That's what's happening. But to continue our incredible momentum, you have to get your friends, get your family, get your neighbors, get your co-workers, get out and vote Republican, vote for Cindy Hyde-Smith, and vote for Roger Wicker. Got to do it. A vote for Republicans is a vote for lower taxes, less regulation, and more products made right here in the USA. It's a vote to reduce crime, respect law enforcement, and restore the rule of law. It's a vote for strong borders, safe communities, and thriving families, which you are. And a vote for Republicans is a vote to reject the Democrat politics of anger, destruction, chaos, and to come together as neighbors, as citizens, and as Americans. To everyone in this room tonight, to every citizen watching all across our land, this is your time to choose. Very important time when you look at what's happening to Judge Kavanaugh. This is a very important time. It's time to choose whether we turn backward to the failure and frustrations of the past 
or whether we continue forward into the unlimited promise of our future. It's not up to the media or the pundits to decide your fate. It's up to you. The future is in your hands, as it was in 2016. That was a beautiful time. There has never been an election like this in our country's history. You have the power, just as you did in 2016, with your vote to save America from socialism and to save America from decay. It's up to you on November 6th to choose a future of patriotism, prosperity, and pride. Loyal citizens like you help build this country, and together, we are taking back our country, returning power to everyday Americans. We stand on the shoulder of the giants of American history, the greatest, the toughest, the most courageous men and women ever to walk the face of the earth. Our ancestors crossed the oceans, settled a continent, won a revolution, and fought to victory in two world wars. Think of it. Think of it. Right? Think of it. American patriots defeated fascism, triumphed over communism, and delivered millions and millions and millions of people into freedom. These courageous patriots did not shed their blood, sweat, and tears so that we could sit at home while others tried to tear down their legacy and destroy our proud American heritage, right? Just like the pioneers and patriots who came before us, we are going to work, we are going to fight, and we are going to win, win, win. We will not bend, we will not break, we will never give in, we will never give up, we will never back down, we will never surrender, and we will always fight on to victory. Because we are America, and our hearts bleed red, white, and blue. We are one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. And together, we will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you very much, Mississippi. Get out.